You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Visit bpn.fm to discover more. Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And I'm Liz Estin. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Liz and Andrew to like musical theater. And today we have our highest of brows on um, and our strangest Mm. of Mm -hmm. accents (laughs) to talk about high art and high (sighs) classical music. You know, movies are just kind of... I'm sorry, did you say movies? I think you mean films. Ah, films are just kind of... It's a higher art form than musicals, really, which is why I feel <clears throat> a lot better talking about one of these. You, you see, know. theater changes. Film, you have one chance and it's locked forever in cellular. Yes. That it's. Is- mm. <laughs> this is what these two sound like when we're not recording, by the way. <laughs> see, they, their other voices are fake. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Our 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 lower class personas of musicals with cheese. We took them off to talk about where the cinematic what, what's, experience. What's, what are those? Uh, what are those like guys that pretend to be rednecks on that? Like, uh, and and really they're like really rich. What is oh, it? The yeah. they the duck duck dynasty. Oh, the duck dynasty yes. guys. Yeah, yeah we're like, we're like duck dynasty. <laughs> 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 I don't know how any of this ties in. Um, you know what? Fuck it. I'll do a real bit. You know, I've been seeing ghosts of the woman I've been abused and subsequently killed herself. Yeah. Have you been harassing women too? Oh, oh yes. It? Oh, not just women. Basically, anyone that tries to take control out of me, I will 100% destroy them emotionally until the point of my own destruction. And you know what? I refuse to relinquish any control because I am just that kind of arrogant. Wow. wow, that is a really great story, Jess. Yeah, video How games suck. <laughs> video games. <laughs> this week, we're not. We are that's talk- not the episode. We're not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> this week, we are talking about Todd Field, famous film Tar. Cue the music, I guess. The classical music. <laughs> So Tar is a film written and directed by Todd Field, music by Hildur Gordon Dotir, famously the composer, Oscar-winning composer of Joker. Um, the film Tar premiered at the 79th Venice Film Festival on September 1st, 2022, and it had its first North American screening at the 49th Telluride Film Festival, September 3rd, 2022. Following a limited theatrical release, October 7th, 2022, expanding to a octo- uh, wide release on October 28th. The film is set in international world of classical music. It centers on Lydia Tarr, played by Kate Blanchett, widely considered one of the greatest lives, living composer conductors and first ever female chief conductor of the major German orchestra. Some things go down and shit doesn't go well for Lydia Tarr. So let, let's talk about this. I've been wanting to talk about this for a full year. I almost had us do it last year. It has been something I've been sitting on because I'm like, is it really a musical? But fuck it, let's do it. I, I, there, I, there's a lot of things to say about this film. And for better or for worse, this is a film to be talked about. Um, it is a strangely good companion piece to a film that just came out within the last couple of weeks called Maestro, directed by Bradley Cooper. And both of them center on Mahler's Fifth Sym- Symphony. Um, and uh, Bernstein's uh, performance and conducting and arrangement of that is mentioned quite a bit in this film. 
So I part of me regrets not having this be a double feature where we compare the two conductor based uh, feature films. One about a real uh, conductor that feels a little heightened in this is a real kind of feeling biopic about a fictional character. So, Andrew, tell us a little bit about Tar. Oh, man, where where do you even start with Tar? Uh, this is this is a movie about the worst person you've ever met in your life. Um, so you, the most pretentious, uh, the most uh, narcissistic, uh, manipulative, um, just power hungry piece of shit you've ever met. Um, yeah, that's that's the movie. <laughs> I mean, it has a little bit more to it than that. It does. Um, it's it is it is a character study though more than anything, and uh, that's the character. So, <laughs> um, so Todd Field. When I say that name, he's the director of this film. What do you think about? It? Like, does that name mean anything to you? <clears throat> it means nothing to me right now, but isn't maybe this, it will when you tell me what he's done. Isn't this his first movie? No, it is not his first movie. He's also started as an actor, but. His first film was in 2001. His second film was in 2006. And then he didn't do another film until 2022 with Tar. So that is about 16 years in between. So this is his return to filmmaking. He apparently was working on a lot of things in between, but the screenplays just didn't kind of materialize into films. And this was one where he had this character and this story, but originally had it made for a man. And he changed apparently very little of the narrative to make it fit a woman. And I can, you can see that. And I think it would have been a much less interesting, much more boring story. If it were a male lead. Wait a second. I'm sorry. I'm reading his Wikipedia and what the fuck? (laughs) Okay. What do you got? As a child in Portland field was a bat boy for the Portland Mavericks, a minor league baseball (laughs) team owned by Hollywood actor, Bing Russell, Kurt Russell, Played for the Portland Mavericks during this time. Field and his family developed Big League Chew, the bubblegum brand, and sold it to the Wrigley Company. So this, the guy who directed this made Big League Chew when he was a bat boy for the team that Kurt Russell played on. Don't forget appearing in Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah, so uh, that's just a funny story from Wikipedia, but yeah, let's, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. What a wild uh, tangent there. Um, no one ever asks him about that, I bet. No, I, that, I mean, that's something I would ask him about, though. Like, that's how, the first what was thing that I would like? ask. Yeah, like... Todd Field, come on to our podcast. We'll only ask you about Big League Chew. Yeah, Todd it. Field, Big League Chew. We want the Big League Chew story. I yeah. want the Big League Chew story. I want it to be as deeply in- integrated and horrifying as Tar. Like, I want to know, like, as you were five years old creating Big League Chew with Kurt Russell, that you saw the ghosts of, like, minor <laughs> league baseball players it, that just out of the corner of your eye during some of this, you heard the screaming of Babe Ruth in the in the corner as you thought, like, chewing gum? You also saw the ghost of the mascot of Big League Chew, just how he came up with the mask. So that was his sleep paralysis demon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Tar. Tar. So, w- what is the plot, like, properly? I know you said, like, the worst kind of person ever, but there is sort of a plot. There is a narrative push, and there is 100%. There is. Because I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the filmmaking, but I know you, we, we probably do need to cover the plot. Yes. So, the actual plot. Um, so, Tar is, um, she is the conductor for the Berlin Philharmonic, yes. Uh, yes. if I have that correct. Yes, I have the um, pot summary of Andrew, so if you have any gaps, just let me know. I can help you. Yeah, out. yeah, I might I might run into a couple, because it it's just a very long and complicated Yeah, it's a lot going on, movie. so I got you. Yeah. But plot-wise, like, I feel like the plot is pretty <laughs> simple for the most part. Um, uh, she has a personal assistant that she relies on um, pretty heavily for, like, dates and emails and all that type of shit who is very important to the plot later on um and her name's like felicia or something like that mm-hmm. uh her name is francesca francesca yeah, francesca yeah i was close um so 
Jeez, what's actually important? What can I kind of leave out? Well, let's start off she, with the lecture. Yes. So she does this lecture where she, um, God, I, I'm going to probably like get wrong what the lecture is supposed to be about, but I'm going to talk about what I thought. This student is doing, uh, like he's doing a conduct, he's conducting and getting criticized by the class and her, uh, for the conducting. And he has chosen some piece by a woman in Iceland or something like that mm -hmm. because a he didn't piece. feel, he didn't feel that he, uh, <laughs> I'm assuming the student is a he, I guess. I don't remember. Um, they're uh, pangendered. BIPOC pangender okay. student, according to Wikipedia. According to Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> uh, he, he's, he didn't want to cover one of the, like, the canon um, uh, pieces from, you know, like the, the, the white men, white cis men. Bach is uh, specifically what Bach. he was against. Yeah, he didn't want to do Bach, but it, it was probably a lot of them uh so she kind of like goes off on that and like just kind of kind of directly attacks him personally uh in a very like direct way that's kind of just mean in front of the entire class and uh he just calls her a bitch and walks out and then the scene ends so i think that scene's important to bring up because it will become plot relevant later but we open the film with this Q&A between her and just some, like, media, like, New York interview. Times. New York Times bullshit kind of puff piece interview. I think it was the New Yorker. It's even worse, actually. Yeah. Is it New Yorker? I think yeah, it pretty sure it's the New Yorker, yeah. Yeah, which is even more, like, puff piece fucking Where bougie shit. Basically, <laughs> he was just kind of sucking her ass the entire time. But every single thing that she says there is immediately contradicted in this lecture. Where in that she's like, well, you have to take in like Mahler's relationships and marriage and know his personal life. And then the next lecture scene, she's immediately like, no, you have to ignore like his marital relations when it comes to art and all. That. So she has no values. And I think that's an important contrast that we have there where she will posit all these things only when it's effective to her in the moment. She has no true artistic values. She is just kind of whatever benefits her, which I think is yeah. very effective. I also think it's of note that she um, she talks one way about the uh, people that are part of the canon, like Mahler and Bach, mm -hmm. um, but she is choosing to be very uh, hostile to someone who is trying to, you know, do a new piece by someone who is not part of that canon. <laughs> I also think it's because she can't hold authority over them, because this entire film is about power and all that. So she has studied Bach and all the classics but if someone brings something new she can't be the authority over that she can't have memorized that she can't have done that so she can't run things like the amount of time she interrupts people so that she can have the full say and control and conduct whatever's going around it's stifling and that's just another thing here where she is always has to be the ring light leader and if anyone else pushes for control in any way whether it be sexual romantic or even just in a conversation, she will fight them. You know, as, as someone who has, I'm not going to call myself a classic musician because I'm not, but as someone who's been in the rooms and has been in that environment where classical music is like a thing, uh, I fucking hate the idea of the classical canon and I hate the way classical music is taught. And I think there has been a big push recently to change that. Um, and I think it's interesting that this this movie is aware of that and comments on it directly with with the lead basically being the uh, the old guard like uh, yeah. pushback to it. Um, um, so but we, after the lecture, we're introduced to Lydia's uh, wife and adopted daughter. Um, and we hear that Tar had uh, an apprentice maybe maybe more than that maybe kind of a sexual partner named Krista who's just begging for like help from Tar through Francesca and um eventually Krista kills herself and Krista's family wants to sue blaming Lydia and what she's done yeah, for blacklisting which, her uh, we're worth noting this takes place throughout the entire runtime yes yeah. um 
the, the a lot of these aspects don't really come into play until later but yeah. it's all like introduced and there's like multiple plots running against each other yes. so it's hard to like jump back and forth while you're trying to explain it so i'm just trying to get like that big like pendulum that piano out or early on um continue I'll... there's other other aspects like uh she's trying to replace her um like co-conduct not co-conduct like assistant conductor, second, conductor. Uh, second. second conductor that's what it is um and she's uh, sort of promised that role to her assistant um sort of um but when uh, when it actually comes down to it she refuses to actually give it to her um which causes a, a lot of problems for her because um well she's trying to cover up a suicide um, yeah. That is basically her fault, and the only other person who knows all the details and can share all the details, um, she just betrayed. So <laughs> you can see where that would go. What were yeah. you gonna say, Liz? Oh, I was gonna say the man interviewing her in the opening scene is Adam Gopnik, who is and currently still is a staff writer for the New Yorker. So you know, I, I kind of like it when they bring. It's like when you yeah. see Leonard Moulton doing anything in a movie; oh, yeah. it makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. I was just from my area, which is weird. That was unrelated to this, but you know, we from my area. Anyway, Tar. Um, tar. Um, so we have a lot of other things happening in the background here. So Lydia's got that going on. She's also conducting and prepping to conduct because she's done all of Mahler's uh, other things. She was building up to the Fifth Symphony, um, and she's kind of trying to outdo Leonard Bernstein, um, Bernstein, who very very famously did it previously many years ago and it's hard to top that but on top of that she starts having hallucinations and very freaky kind of ghostly apparitions just out of the corner of the frame and like it, it google if you after you watch the movie google like all the times a ghost is just in the background and it freaks you out and the screaming like she'll just hear screamings have these sound sensitivities and Which, according to Amazon, is actually taken directly from a uh, the, the Blair Witch Project, in the woods yeah, with the Blair Witch Project, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Like, I love that. Thanks, Amazon, for that little. The tip. funny thing was, <laughs> like, the first thing I saw when I started the movie, the credits are rolling, and it was like, fun fact: the screams in the movie are from the Blair Witch Project. No screaming had occurred yet. I had only seen the production logos. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I guess I'm, I guess we're in for a good time. Cool. I mean, take where you can. I, I can tell there's a lot of horror influence in this. And Andrew, I mean, all three of us really love horror films. So I enjoy it on that part, as well as like the classical music kind of pieces. Um, yeah. the, the most horrific part is when her neighbor, the elderly person, fell, fell <laughs> and needs help and all that. Like, that is a really disturbing scene. Uh, truly horrendous and just... Uh, well, let, let's let's just talk about where it ends up because we yes. we get eventually we get to a point yeah. where um, a YouTube poop version of her lecture gets released. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. It's it's accurate, honestly. <laughs> um, and she gets called in, and and really, it's not about that though. Like, it's that's like an excuse to talk about the suicide thing that was going on. Um, and basically everything falls apart for her. She ends up having to move back to the States. Excuse me, you got, you skipped over one of the most hilarious lines oh, in the yeah. movie, which is, oh, okay. she vandalized my Wikipedia page. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that, that is, like, the height of entitlement. Yeah. She also, like, basically, she, she also she loses custody of her daughter, too. Yes. Yeah, completely. She gets canceled. Yes. Um, By the world and her family. To the States, she um hits her head on after like exploring an abandoned building for whatever yeah. reason and fucks up her face um and then she ends up like in hiding and she goes to some like some country where she Philippines just, she goes to the Philippines the Philippines and ends up at a brothel where she she uh, vomits profusely and then at the very end she's like rehearsing for a piece and it's revealed uh, that oh it's a it's a video game convention and she's playing for in one of those orchestras for monster hunter, hunter. <laughs> yes uh, um, and it literally just ends before you, uh anything else that's that's the ending um and yeah um so andrew i knew from the moment i uh, was going to do this that you'd have thoughts on that ending yeah so like let's talk about it so she picks the number 5 right and in the brothel 
number five looks at her and that causes her to vomit. And she was going to be doing Mahler number five. Yeah. yeah. So like that is like a big, th- that's not what you wanted me to talk about, is it? Oh, no, it's the video games. Um... <laughs> yeah, he wants to talk about video games. No, yeah, no, okay. no. Okay, I just, so I have thoughts on it, but I just don't know what they wanted us to think. Because my initial thought is this is just a joke. It's just a gag. Ha ha. She's playing demeaning garbage. She doesn't, she's playing video game shit. And I'm like, I'm glad you know, the highbrow creator of Big League Chew is looking down <laughs> on video <laughs> games like this. Yeah, it's just like, and it's just kind of like, you know, somebody in real life, like, wrote that and conducted it and like are you telling are you saying that they have no artistic value we shouldn't care what they think about their music like is it a joke to ask like what did the composer of this piece for this video game write? like would you say that about like john williams like would you look at like a scene in a movie that he wrote and be like what did he think and it's like oh what a joke i mean he wrote it for a movie <laughs> like the but- thing about it is um for me at least <laughs> I think okay. one of the recurring themes about uh, Lydia throughout the entire story is she has an inability to create anything of her own. Um, yes. Like, she can only kind of interpret other things. She can't things. write beyond, like, three measures of a song before yeah. she gets distracted. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's it's, like, her value and things. So she looks down on anything new. Like, we see that very early on, like, with in the lecture she only looks back at the artist because there's been so many interpretations and she has like the laziest interpretation of everything i think she like says at one point like love is her interpretation of the fucking Mahler fifth symphony yeah and she speeds yeah. it up she just speeds it up by like five minutes or something and she's like that's my interpretation yeah, like well, <laughs> yes <laughs> okay <laughs> so putting her into this thing where it's kind of rigid she can't have any impact and she's not even writing it, like just basically. She puts a headset on. She's that's literally it, yeah. like she's she's tuned into a click, basically. Yeah, yeah. that's all um, she is. Um, I think it's that more than the lack of value to video games. At least that's my interpretation. I, I actually I do agree with that, and I think that that's what they were going for. Yeah. But it does feel like a little bit of like a haha. It's for video games because they end it with like a shot of like cosplayers in the audience and it's like <laughs> okay yeah, like like, way- like are we just taking a cheap shot that like gamers are like lowbrow like fuck you like the way they cut to the <laughs> cosplayers feel as like a comedy cut it's like haha it like is. how far she's gone down she's playing for people in costumes it it's it, like, okay. I will say I did laugh very very hard the first time I watched this and got to that point it was very funny to me um, and I that guess. was the moment I knew I had to find some excuse for you to watch this movie. But I've been to that. Like, I literally traveled to to Boston to watch the uh, the eight big 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 band, which fucking phenomenal, by the way. You should check them out. Uh, they play jazz renditions of a lot of great video game music. Um, so, you know, the movie didn't need to make fun of me. I've never, uh, <laughs> I've never been a narcissistic piece of shit that fucking abused people to suicide. <laughs> I don't think it's making fun of you. I think it's like really kind of tearing Tar Lydia down, making her feel like the shittiest person in the room. Because I guess I, I think what it's supposed to be is that like she has been mocking these other conductors for being robots and blah blah blah. And like at the end, she puts a headset on and is literally nothing more than a than a metronome essentially, um, which is a uh, it isn't it's embarrassing for her just based on what she's said in the past and how fucking snooty she's been. Yeah, so, but even that. in the first scene, her first thing is like, well, basically all you are is a human metronome. And she's like, yeah, you're basically right. <laughs> yeah, and then the movie ends with her being a human, like metronome, a human metronome. So Yes. <laughs> um, truly, truly. Um, an interesting character piece here. Um, is Lydia Tar redeemable in any way? No. Uh, no, she never learned anything. So, like, no. And she's done horrible, horrible shit. And just just in case you might be like, well, I mean, maybe she could be like recovered. Like, no, no. Like, even beyond that, just her personally, she is like a pretentious, boring person, just completely lacking in any artistic value, um, unable to do anything for herself other than just reinterpret what other people have done in her own like narcissistic way. Like 
and, and she just ruins music. Like she's one of those people that just ruins what music even is. Now you uh, are a musician. What do you mean by that? So like people like her who are like, um, we have to look at what the composer thought and we have to do this. And, and then she like fucking is so strict with her own vision and blah, blah, blah. Music is supposed to be like a communal act. And yes. back when Bach would write those pieces, that's what it was. Um, classical music used to have solos in it. Like you wouldn't just fucking write, literally read what's exactly written and, and play it exactly as written. Um, like there have been pieces that are, are written to be more strict, but uh, the, I feel like this mentality that's infected a lot of like the classical music is what we've, what people have been fighting against recently when they're talking about like, we need to stop this classical canon type bullshit. Um, uh, you know, and, and it's why people are upset whenever Beethoven gets played for the 15th millionth time over like some new artist. Like it's not, mm -hmm. it's not how music is supposed to, to work. <laughs> yes. Um, how about we go into our letterbox in a mid show and then I can talk a little bit about filmmaking um, when we get back. In case this is your first episode, this is a game where Andrew and Liz have to guess the actual real-life letterbox reviews of Tar based on only the review alone, and the review will either be a one-star or a five-star. All right, Andrew, are you ready? All right, Liz, are you ready? Oh, yeah. I'm ready. I know, this, I know this movie like the back of my hand. Um, and I, I don't believe you. Tell it to me, uh, Gonzo and the Christmas Carol. Well, let's see. There's uh there's a freckle right here. And... Oh, you. <laughs> oh. All right, Andrew, you're first. <clears throat> um packs tobacco dip into lip. Yep, here's a mighty fine piece of work indeed. Spits into spittoon. Mm -hmm. Mighty fine. They ain't make them like they used to. Sticks hand in spittoon and plays around. Yep, you can't come across something as good as this, and they ain't do it like no more. That no more. Finds a winning golden ticket in Spittoon. Hooey! I done got me one of them gilded tickets. I'm off to the Wonka factory to don't find me some of that chocolate. Yeehaw! This was I feel not like this is for the no, wrong movie. No, it was <laughs> not. I was, I was equally baffled at this being in the tar. Wait, so this you're for real that you're a hundred percent sure this was I not for one hundred percent sure because I remember it. Um, <laughs> this is really hard. I mean, I guess. Um, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We're gonna go with five. That is a one star. Sorry, Andrew. Liz, you're up. Are what? You ready? <laughs> Conservative lecturer destroys SJW college student. You won't believe what happens next. Uh, five. That is correct. Andrew, my GF loves this movie. Is that a red flag? <laughs> um, well, as far as like, is it a red flag? Yes. Um, but <laughs> like, if if you're if if they love this movie, they're probably a film bro. I'm sorry. So, uh, we're gonna go with five. That is correct. Or no, that is wrong. That's a one. <gasps> You're wrong. Oh, fuck me. Liz. You gotta get my hopes up like that. Yeah. I'm I've so done sorry. it. I've done it, Andrew. It's not fun. Liz, are you ready? I'm ready. I don't know what that was. Oh, I know that Kate Blanchett played a lesbian and, uh. So they were horny and confused. It's five. That is a one. Damn. Andrew. Bad horny. Edgy. I mean, not not wrong. I mean, there is definitely edgy parts here. Um, five. We're gonna go with five. That is a one, Andrew. You're doing real dog shit fucker. this game. I really, yeah. I mean, you're giving me some of these hard ones. Yeah, you like, gave that was him a the, one. The first one you gave him was, was a one word. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Liz. Yes. This is just a cunty Cosmo Kramer. <laughs> I, I don't Cosmo, understand. Cosmo Kramer's from Seinfeld. Yes. Okay, I've never seen Seinfeld. I'm so sorry. I don't uh, get the reference even. I've seen Seinfeld. I don't get what they mean. Oh, five? That's a one. Damn, even I'm bad. Andrew, she vandalized yes. my Wikipedia. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, I still want to say five, but I feel like maybe not. Um, no, I'm, gonna do, I'm going for it. Mm, wait, maybe. 
No, five. It's five. It's a five. It's a five. Yes, it is. You are correct. Yes. (laughs) Liz. Yes. Violated by Kate's voice. Okay. Uh, I don't get it, but good on you. Uh, Five. One. Andrew. Yep. Kate is so horny. That's a five. Horny five. Guarantee. What was that? Horny is a five stars. Guaranteed. That is correct. Andrew, you have taken the lead. Wait, I only have two points, though. Yeah, Liz only had one. Yeah, I only have one point. Oh, my God. (laughs) Um, Liz. Yes? When you call me on stage, can you introduce me as Joker? (laughs) Oh, no. I I saw Joker with my boyfriend, and I I remember walking to the car and thinking, if he likes this movie, I'm going to break up with him. I'm going to consider breaking up with him. He didn't like it. Thank God. Joker was a huge piece of shit. And it was I'm a so giant piece of shit. For us to see Joker 2 next year. Fuck. I forgot about that. Anyway. Uh, 2024 is a good year, kids. This, I didn't uh, watch Joker. I You're watched. probably good. You're, You're probably better off. You don't need to watch it. Just watch the scene. Uh, that's five because they actually watched Joker. Um, that is a one. Andrew, yeah. last question. Yep. No matter what, you're winning. You're Liz... winning, man. <laughs> I, I'm down for that. Yeah. Olivia Wilde nod. Oh, I, I get it. I get it. Yep. I don't get it. Liz, uh, don't explain, worry, explain. darling. Uh, how Olivia Wilde started like dating Harry Styles while on set while she was technically still with Jaden Sudeikis, probably. Oh, that makes uh, maybe. sense. Maybe. I don't know what the timing was on that. It's all speculation. All I know is she was really cunty to my girl Florence Pugh, and I, I would die for that woman. I would die for Florence Pugh as well. She's, she's my boo. Yeah, I'm glad she's not with that crazy creep, um, Zach Efron. Zach Braff? No. Okay, <laughs> okay so that's going to be a five stars. Yeah. I thought about they made a funny joke. Yes, that is correct. And Andrew, you have won the letterbox game. A woman loses a letterbox game on the Tar episode. How dare you? <laughs> oh no, Tar, Tar is incredibly anti-feminist. Tar I mean, is very anti-women, that, so this is actually kind of correct. Well, no, True. she just feels that women need to stop bitching about not being in men's spaces and just be better. Um, at least that's what she believes. Lydia Tar is a bad well, person. Lydia Tar is a very bad person. I'm a woman, and Lydia Tar is a bad person. Um, yeah. How about we go into a mid show and then talk more about what a bad person she is? <laughs> Hey guys, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we've got a shill at you. Today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Andrew, tell us a little bit about Patreon and who's supporting us. Man, Patreon's where you can go if you want to get extra content from us and also support us financially so we can keep the show running. Uh, we got commentary tracks and some other stuff, and we're going to start doing meetups more consistently every month. And also, we'll read your name, and you can recommend shows, and blah, blah, blah. Just go to Patreon, my God. Our current patrons are, all right, <coughs> Melissa Goldman, Danielle Rennix, Jess Stampede, Ewan Cassidy, Monica Thoreau, Brent Black, Lathaniel Stacey Coon, Joseph Evans Green, Mary Lou Choquette, John Van Alves, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Emily Gracie, Kyle Summers, Janae C, Scoot and Tech Tower of Dreamcoat, Liz Lins, nothing is certain except Beth and Texas Thespian, Robert Benjamin, Jessica T, Mitchell Young, Chai Teacup, Chris Marcote, E.G. Marie Anastasio, Trevi Joseph, uh, Leela, R.J. Noriga, Julia McLannan, Bjorn Hermans, Toriana Frazier, Sammy the Adequate Amount Jacobson, Kaylee Blazier, Cinemageddon Reviews, Villainous Miss, Sophina Ali, The Omega Geek, Paige Pearson, Maddie Wargle, Eliza Erdman, Anna Loskatova, Sarah Den Blaker, Evan Ball, Zachary Torres, Aurora Morasso, Mara Folloin, Lisa L., Possessed Washing Machine, Nick R- RO10, Puffy Boy, uh, Julia Hardy, Sydney Hicks, Anna Bell, Billy Clifton, Andrew Wright, The Red Caboose Kaboom, Gold Plated, Hikamoro, Julia Balder's Daughter, and Rex. They all give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you'd like to join them in supporting us and get all those fun perks, plus a bunch of new shit that we've got coming up, come join us over at the Patreon. Lady Pates, the Patey Pace, the Patey 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 Pace. Um, Alright, let's get back to the show. Also, this is our last episode of the year. Isn't that fucking wild? That's nuts. <laughs> So let's talk about the filmmaking of Tar. Because songs are weird. Um, 
Yeah, there's not really songs to talk it's about. Just it's just like the, except for that one apartment scene, but you'll probably oh, yeah. sing that Let's later. Let's talk about the one song in this movie. Um, apartment for sale, an original <laughs> piece, uh, I believe written by Kate Blanchett herself. Um <laughs> Andrew, describe this song for us. Um, uh, wild wailing on a uh, accordion that just sounds like it is intentionally supposed to sound bad because it is. Um, mixed in with uh, uh, trying to make people upset that they're selling their apartment and she's going to make a lot of noise. And their sister is in jail. Yes. Um. So they. There's not much more. Yeah, it's pretty not nuanced. It's like two minutes. Less than two minutes. It, I- I'd say like 30 seconds. It's like 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's our one song. Let's start with the filmmaking of Tar. Um, I find this very masterful, but very deeply uncomfortable using wide lenses and basically putting the camera as far away from the action and just letting it happen um, is intriguing. It plays a lot like a stage play and it, it lets these long, long scenes play out in basically oneers, and it's not showy about it. Um, it feels very intentionally done and makes your eyes kind of wander and lets your eyes kind of decide who to look at during the scenes. Like specifically um, the lecture scene where um, we have Lydia talking to this boy and we just hold in this, this two shot for a good long while and it keeps moving and adjusting depending on where we need to be. And it's, I know that they worked on this so often and that they um, were very stressed out doing it and every redoing of it was um, an emotional ordeal. And I think they had it one other time and there was something wrong where she slipped out of focus and they had to do it at least four or five times to get it right again. But look at how every one of these shots, like things that start um, with like uh, this two shot becomes less than five seconds, a different kind of two shot and the way things move. The, the fact that it had to be choreographed with the camera, with the actors and make it all look precisely timed makes this the difference between something like this and something like lame is where we hold in the close up and there's no art to it. Um, but with that, it makes your eyes kind of scant around more often. Um, for th- Things hidden, and there are a lot of things hidden. Did any of you see the ghosts at any point? Honestly, I knew that they were there, and I still didn't because I've yeah. I've seen things about this, but I still wasn't able to like catch any. Yeah, I, I didn't really catch for. any ghosts. Let's take a look at this. So we got this video, hidden ghost and tar, um, and they're like real, real hidden back there. Like you, yeah, like see that looks like a that looks like a coat. Yeah, like, you would. Like, where even is it in this? We've got this one. Do you see it at all? This is the one that I've seen before. Yeah, this is the I one that I saw a, a gif of. It was behind her as she moves yes. past the, uh, the and window. And here they brightened up the footage, and you can see Oh, I see, show. I see. That's fucking creepy. Like, shit like that. Like, um, like, when I saw Hereditary for the first time, and you see the mom on the ceiling. That kind of stuff really, really toys with me. I love hidden things like that. And I, I seeing it on a small screen really doesn't do it justice. If you blow it up, you will catch things like that and a lot more things. You will catch your mistakes as a filmmaker more and more if you put it on a really big screen, which is terrifying to think about. That's uh, where people will watch it when it first comes out. Yeah. <laughs> and in revival screenings and whatnot. Or, shit, TV screens at home are getting bigger and bigger at this point. Yeah, they're getting huge. Yeah. Um, I think that the effectiveness of it is really good. How do we feel about Kate Blanchett's performance as Lydia Tarr? Uh I I think it was phenomenal. I, I don't I don't have any complaints. I don't it's, know what your opinions are. It's incredible. It's incredible uh to watch a woman like in a movie just be that like like be like unlikable but in a way like you can't you can't help but watch her despite all her actions. You can't keep her eyes off of her. 
Yeah, she's <laughs> totally, she, you, can't, you cannot like her this entire movie. But you want to keep watching her talk about pretentious bullshit somehow. Like. She really is just nothing but pretension in, in like. She's magnificent in this. Did she win the Oscar? No, Michelle Yeoh. Oh, Michelle Yeoh won that year. That's, that's correct. So uh, everyone was kind of behind Kate Blanchett for this up until the Oscars, and then Everything Everywhere kind of swept, deservingly in my opinion. I loved Everything Everywhere, but I, I really appreciate what Kate Blanchett was doing in this film. Um, I'm not sure I love her and most of her other work. Not anything against her, but I am... include Carol? I've not seen Carol, so that is something that I need to change. You need to see Carol. It's so I know, I know. I love lesbian love stories and all that. But like Benjamin Button, I, I think she's like the one of the less interesting parts. I feel like Tilda Swinton is doing so much more in her limited screen time in that movie than uh, Kate Blanchett is doing. Um, and then, you know, I, I liked her in the Pinocchio as like the weird demon creature, the blue fairy cat. <laughs> Remember that? Remember when we did that? Last yep. year. Yep. <laughs> the, you know, you, the funny thing is you were you watched, I remember this because I'm editing, I started editing the Christmas video but didn't finish it. It'll come out next Christmas probably because yeah. there's plenty of time. But Andrew, you said you watched Pinocchio's Rankin Bass and then Guillermo del Toro's right after. So you canceled out the Rankin Bass one by watching the <laughs> Guillermo del Toro one. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to think of things I've really loved her in. Like, She's barely in Eyes Wide Shut as, like, an uncredited role. She was tiny bit in Hot Fuzz. Like, yeah, I, I'm... Thor Ragnarok, it, she was the bad person in that. But, yeah, here is really where she gets to shine. And I like that this stands in the real world. Like, they mentioned the pandemic. They mentioned things that make it feel more a Lord part of, of our Rings? reality. I am so insanely bored by all three of the War of the Rings movies. Okay. While I can appreciate what they do and how they do it, I watched them once, said that was enough for me, and then walked away. Yeah. However, the Lord of the Rings musical looks like it fucks, and I, I like that each act is one of the books. That looks kind of fun. I'm a big fan of the Lord of the Rings movies. Uh, I think they're a lot of fun, but they are very long, and I would not watch them more than once every five years. Yeah, I, I watched the first one and I loved it. So I started watching the second one and then got lost track of the armies after like an hour and a half. So I stopped and that was like six years ago. So I have I, not seen them since. Oh, but the second one's the best one. That's I the, know, but I just Chris finished the Lee first one that. and I was tired. So like, <laughs> I think the ranking goes uh, Fellowship uh, to, I think they're the order they are. Fellowship, Two Towers, then Return of the King. I think Two Towers has high highs, but the overall experience kind of leaves you feeling hollow. Fellowship is the most like a movie. Fellowship feels like a real movie where the other two feels like lore, lore dumping. And then the Hobbit movies are garbage. Yes. Yes, agreed. I haven't even seen them, and I agree. I have seen them, and there is no reason to watch them. You should not do that. <laughs> but Kate Blanchett is in all of them, and she's probably fine. Kate Blanchett's going to be in the Borderlands adaptation. Oh, oh you see, boy. so she has a respect for video games. Yes, yeah, see, she likes video games. I don't think she has any problems with video games. Yep. I don't think the film even has problem with video games. I think it just used it as a cheap punchline at the end of the movie. I which guess felt a little bit sad. You know what would have been more <laughs> pointed if it was like a Marvel movie like equivalent? Like, honestly, that would have been a bit better because I, yeah. I genuinely do feel like the people writing scores for Marvel movies probably don't want to be doing that. Oh yeah. Unless you're like <laughs> doing the Black Panther score which apparently like put so much easier work into it but the rest of them are like yeah I'm just gonna make some music. I like Danny Elfman's score to the Doctor Strange movie but the second Danny Elfman, one or the first one? The second one. Okay. But also Danny Elfman is a is a sex pest same as Lydia Tarr. Do we, did we all hear about the horrible things he did? To be honest, no. No, I, I, I saw a tweet and then I was like, I don't need to know this right now. I'll find out. A woman um, he ext basically said, I will only shut up if you pay me $500,000. He didn't pay it. And then she revealed all the horrendous, horrendous things he did to her, including sending her a picture of a martini glass full of his cum. A martini glass? Did he pull Christ. that out of a drain? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Saltburn, Salt now burn. on Amazon Prime. You know what? That would be a Watch really your inter- family. You know what? That would be a really interesting double feature. Tar and Saltburn, both on Amazon Prime, give you two different kinds of sensations of feeling icky inside. Yeah. But one is really good, and the other one is Saltburn. Oh. So what is our <laughs> overall thoughts on tar and our cheese ratings? What a way to go out on 2023 and bring in 2024. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right, fellas? We are recording, for context, we are recording this the day after Christmas. You can tell we are all beat fucking tired because the holidays just drained every yeah. ounce of energy out of us. So we're trying, kids. I also worked a full eight-hour shift today, y'all. Tar is, uh, tar is very good. Um, I wouldn't watch it unless you're in a in a mood, a saucy uh, mood. It's, it's quite long, um, which is generally something I don't like. But when it's really good, I can make an exception. Uh, and it uses the time well. It never feels like it's just kind of doing shit, you know. It doesn't ever have like a "why was that scene even there?" like "who cares?" moment. So yeah. it's like every everything is intentionally placed. Maybe they could have trimmed it a bit, but there was really. It never felt like it was like, well, that was a waste of time. Like, why the fuck was that there? It wasn't like watching It Chapter 3 or something like that. Oh, God. If they oh made God, one of those. I hated that. Um, so, that movie yeah, that it's doesn't really exist. Good. Just like if the you Lion have King a, movie. If you, have, if you have an absolute disdain for snooty fucks who are ruining music by trying to turn it into high-class art, which it never has been and never will be, um, uh, then yeah, this is great. Especially, especially uh, snooty musicians who have no fucking talent of their own and can't write shit. Tar, Tar couldn't write a fucking Beatles song. I'm sorry. <laughs> she could barely write an, uh, an accordion song that involves screaming. Yeah. Okay, so um, as far as a cheese rating goes, I'm going to give it a... Oh, I cannot pronounce these. I'm sorry. Are you on the German um, cheeses page again? Yeah, I'm going to give it... I'm going to give it Doman Dalem. Which is a, a German cheese from Berlin. Uh, hey, seems like a good cheese. There's a lot of German cheeses, so whenever we do something related like to Germany, it's so easy to do a new cheese rating. We didn't mention it, but she changed her fucking name to be more pretentious. Yeah, her, her name real name is Linda Tarr. Tarr with two R's and no apostrophe. And she's from fucking New York. <laughs> she's from Coney Island, <laughs> or Staten Island, or something. Yeah, like what a what a fucking fraud. <laughs> I, I, but the thing is, the movie knows it's so nice when a movie knows like their quote unquote genius is a fucking fraud. Yeah, like you know, uh, Maestro is a different story, and it's very good as well, not in a different way. Um, but also when she goes to the brothel and she gets the number five, and the number five looks at her and she throws up, it's because she can't do number five. She'll never be able to do number five because she'll never do Mahler's number five. I'm sorry, that's that was. She'll the point. never be Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> <laughs> and she gets very upset about that <laughs> as they should um liz that's, that's what about... my my lowbrow interpretation of that scene your lowbrow interpretation, <laughs> lowbrow interpretation. Um, um lydia tara spits in your face lydia pukes in your face uh oh. i i liked tar a lot it's very difficult to watch but it's definitely worth experiencing it's really impeccably made i want to watch it again to find the ghosts honestly like not now, but maybe like a few months from now. Um, it's really interesting to watch this character study of just like a woman who's so fucking awful, but you can't help but watch her and like see what might happen. And when nothing changes, it's like, uh, it's like, come on, but what do you expect? It's a really well done movie. I highly recommend it. Um, don't watch it after Saltburn, I would say, but. I'm not gonna I watch Salt Burn just, afterwards, just to, just to clean just, the palate. I'm not going to agree just this double feature idea, but uh, but yeah. So in honor of Lydia Tarr's love of video games, I'm going to give this movie Stardew Valley's Cheese Cauliflower, which requires one cauliflower and one cheese. And the description is, it smells great. <laughs> That's also so. my description. Yeah. Um, it also doesn't look very good, but it's pixel art. So. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a video game. It's not real art. Yeah. <laughs> Eric Baroni, your game, I'm addicted to it, so don't listen to him. Um, all right. Um, 
I, I like Tar. Tar good. Tar really good. Um, Tar is wonderful. I would watch it any day of the week and twice on Sundays. Um, I do recommend watching it with Saltburn, so you'll appreciate Tar just as much. Um, it'll make you really understand how good a movie you got there. Watch um, it with your parents. Yeah, do the yes. with your parents. Yes. Do, uh, you know what? Don't read anything about Saltburn. Just turn it on with your parents. It is a feel-good mom-daughter-son <laughs> film of the year. It won't ruin and, your family dynamic at all. And you know what? You should have a big old glass of milk when you watch Saltburn. Oh, big, yeah. Oh, big, tall glass. Um, <laughs> A full bathtub full of milk. Um, mm. <laughs> okay, it. wild, but... You're slurping at, that out of the drain, you know? Oh. At Regal Cinemas, they sold cups shaped like bathtubs with the Saltburn logo. I, I am not making this no. up. No, no. Um, yeah, they, I they know they, they sold Wonka hat popcorn buckets but oh god um go see saltburn <laughs> watch it with your mommy um so i am giving tar as my cheese rating the wikipedia page for cheese because she vandalized my wikipedia page <laughs> <laughs> so um, just you know just before we we finish with tar i just want to ask you you know do you think tar there's any like parallels with sunday in the park with george yeah yeah go <laughs> y'all can go fuck yourselves <laughs> you made me watch Sunday in the Park with George, motherfucker. Well, y'all can have your own opinions then. You don't think there's any parallels? Not really. Mm, okay. Nothing about artists. Honestly, I see more parallels with shit like Tick Tick Boom than uh, all that jazz, probably more than Sunday Ooh, in the Park with George. All that jazz is probably a good one. All, yeah. so, all that jazz, I see a lot of parallels there. Okay, I think a tar musical would be really good. Though. Yeah, I make think a, so too. Someone should make a tar musical. Um, who would you have compose it? Oh God! Who who is there even to compose it at this point? <laughs> um, Jason Robert Brown knows a lot about infidelity and abusing people. Yeah, he might actually do a really good job. Yeah. Or or I've heard stories about Janine Tesori not being the nicest person in the world to work with. So mm. I think there might be something there. No, I mean, I feel like there might not be though. Like yeah. the person who directed this was the inventor of. Uh, Big League Chew. Big League Chew. Big League Chew. With Kurt so I Russell. I feel like what we really need is maybe we need a Frank Wildhorn. <laughs> Justin nearly choked on his drink. <laughs> you guys can't see that, but it's so funny. <laughs> the idea of Frank Wildhorn. Uh, and uh, you don't know what he's like. He is like the most like heterosexual kind of like baseball cap. So what we talk about today, guys? We go, we're gonna be looking at some. All right, I can write you a little song about that. A little girl doing a bad thing. Ah, someone like me did bad. <laughs> there it is. I'm gonna sell that to fucking Celine Dion. I think it just sold. I'm with Andrew. You're both wrong. But speaking of people who are wrong, <laughs> uh, thank you guys for listening. Please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Um, that doesn't exist on Musicals with Cheese. We're on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals, Patreon Musicals with Cheese, Instagram Musicals with Cheese, YouTube page Musicals with Cheese, Patreon only podcast, Patreon with Cheese. Shoot us an email at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. Our keeper of the cheese is Juliet Antonio. And sometime, hopefully before the new year, we're going to do our top 10 ranking of episodes this year. Um, hopefully within the first couple of weeks of 2024, you'll get to hear what our best episodes of 2023 were. This show is edited and done very well by Andrew DeWolf. Our themes are created by Robin Nash of IOU Music UK. Thank you to the Broadway Podcast Network for having us on the platform and for not kicking us off for, you know, suggesting that Frank Wildhorn write more musicals. That was truly a heinous thing that we did there. <laughs> I like to imagine Don't him encourage just, him. I like to imagine him just rewriting like half the Jekyll and Hyde songs to be about Lydia Tarr rather than <laughs> Jekyll and Hyde. Honestly, he would probably be like, you know, this Krista person, we should give her a number where she's still infatuated with Lydia Tarr. And it'll go something like this. If someone like you found <laughs> someone like me. <laughs> like there'd be a confrontation with Lydia Tarr and Linda Tarr. It'd be so bad. Yeah, yeah, she's looking at her old self and she flips her hair. All of the two hours, a face in the mirror. I turn my, I'll change the words. Maybe a two or three. No one will notice. It's okay. No one's ever called me out for this before. You know, you know who would actually do a great job writing a, a musical for, for this? Andrew Lloyd Webber. The, com <laughs> the composer for Monster Hunter. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what? Fuck you guys. <laughs> Who composed Monster Hunter? Uh, give me a second. Uh, I think it depends which. Probably depends which game. Okay, according to this, it's a uh, the the. Ooh, I have no idea. It depends which game she was playing from. There's like 800 Monster Hunter games. <sighs> well, I guess we'll never ever know. <laughs> we'll see you next time and next year on Musicals with Cheese. <laughs> Apartment for sale! Apartment for sale! Your mother's very deep! Now you're gonna keep her apartment for sale! Your sister's in jail! You put your sister in jail! No!